Okay, uh, we are now recording and welcome Kristen. Um, handing it over to you now. Thank you for this so nice introduction and I'm so happy and really proud that our ladies Fibro grew that much and has such a big audience. It's really great to see that I could help back then to set this amazing community up uh, down there in south of Germany. Let me, I haven't used, uh, <laughs> I used a lot of uh, online meetings rooms, but not Zoom, funny. So where do I share here now my stuff share screen, the big green button. All right, and I will share my desktop. Perfect. And I will find my slides in a second. Here we go, I move this and I present. Perfect. All right, thumbs up if you can see everything. Perfect. Yeah, I'm really happy to be here. It is quite a while ago that Vivian asked me uh, if I could talk about version control. Um, it is, I have to say, I had quite a little break in my Our Ladies activities since I moved to Toulouse one and a half or almost two years ago. So I'm happy to be back on stage. And, um, but I'm also quite excited. <laughs> so something I haven't done for a bit of a while. So let me, why does it, ah yeah. So hello, I'm Christine. I am born in a small town north of Berlin. Uh, before moving to Toulouse two years ago, I actually lived in Berlin uh, almost 11 years. I did there after studying biosystems engineering. I um, did my PhD in basic research, trying to understand the metabolism of cancer in stem cells, not only in the lab, but also with machines producing a lot of data. And by the end of my PhD, I had like a, such a huge mess of beautiful data um and um back from my studies quite a bit of tools and programming so i ended up in building up a pipeline how to process these kind of data that i acquired in the lab and this is basically my job that i have nowadays here in toulouse at a um, actually german pharmaceutical company called evotech i'm supporting people in the lab to develop tools, 100% um, or let's call 95% in R to automatize the data processing, to visualize the data and to interpret the data and make sense out of it and help them with statistics and all these. Um, yeah, this is my background. I love to put things in place um, for tools. Of course, you think about that you also need kind of a version control because a lot of bioinformaticians are working together on the same tools and you need to do this in your daily way, um, daily basis. Um, but you will be surprised. Um, version control is not an easy topic, even though for bioinformaticians, um, because normally we, Bioinformaticians also come like me from a more biology um, background and you're learning and doing, especially with R, um, developing skills that you need from day to day. And a certain place, um, Russian control pops up and then you start to learn it step by step. So, but before we start, I put here a link and maybe let me get maybe a second organized. Or maybe someone could put this link also in the chat. So I opened a Google Drive share where you can find my slides. But what you can also find there, let me open it, is a Google Doc file um, where I would like to invite you to put all your questions. Um, right now, I even don't see the chat. And um, yeah, so I will focus on my slides. I have a few. Uh, pictures coming up um, next to it, but please feel free to. Ah, yeah, we have to share it. Yes. Um, maybe I can open it and manage myself to have it somewhere. Um, Kristen, we can take care of the chat, and I've okay. just put the document that you're showing um, on your screen. Perfect. So, 
I, I split this roughly in the, um, in the topics that we have throughout the talk. So please feel free just to put your questions there. If we are not coming back to this document, I will follow up in the next two days and put um, my answers there, maybe links and suggestions and so forth. Okay. So where did my slides go? Put that again. Okay. Um, I put a timer that we do like um, five minutes break every 25 minutes or so at minimum. So for me to get some, some water in between, but maybe also to, to run to the bathroom or to get another coffee or so forth, or uh, find a charger for the laptop, which also happened frequently to me. I think this is set. Okay. Um, if you are worried, if you have not installed Git on your laptop or desktop computer, you're working it. I mean, if you have it, it's perfect, but no worries. We have an alternative. Um, I would like to introduce you, maybe you have used it already, RStudio Cloud, where you also have like a Git environment where you could start to play with. In the, in the live coding that we do, a few examples, I will introduce you to RStudio Cloud. If you have a GitHub account to log in there is pretty easy because this is the only thing that you need. But before we get into our studio um, cloud, we have, a, I put a slide for a small break in between. So if you need to set up or check anything, we can do this in this little break. Uh, in this little break. Okay. So first few questions. Um, please comment in the chat. Um, I, um, and it's just for each, it's like four questions, just 30 seconds for each question. Please just reply emojis, one word or whatsoever, just to get to know a bit more. First of all, do you all understand me well? The most important thing. Where did the chat disappear? Yeah. Yes, perfect. Okay. Um, how was the day today? Sunny, rainy, happy, how do you feel? Everything good? Despite that we have still to fight Corona, of course. Long, okay, yeah, I can relate to that. Cold and hungry. Ah, Ramadan, oh gosh. Morning in Canada, greetings to Canada. Okay, let's go. What's your native language? English, Hindi, German, Spanish, Portuguese, Serbian, French. My French, by the way, even though I'm living in Toulouse, it's unfortunately still the beginner level. I get a croissant, this I manage for sure. Persian even. Salam, hui. All right. What's your level of Git experience? And here, let me use like a scale from zero, first time hearing about it, to five, use it regularly, and I have the feeling so much to learn, and 10, I'm a Git master with closed eyes. Okay, we're getting here threes and fives. That sounds good. I have to be honest, I have sometimes the feeling I'm a six or a seven, and there are days that I think I have a, I'm more like a three. <laughs> Git cracking is beautiful, is one of my, my, my favorite ones. Okay. So thank you. And everyone, welcome. Let me, I don't see my slides. Let me move it like this. Okay. So why do we talk today about Git and not GitLab or GitHub? So actually Git is the thing that we need to talk about because Git is the framework that we're using when we are talking actually. Uh, most of the times there are other frameworks, most of the times about um, version control. It is free and it is um, a distributed version control. I come to this in a bit later, which en that enables you to modify your code with like kind of a backup safety net in the background. And one of the most remarkable characteristic of Git is its branching systems. Also, this part is um, this topic is part of our um, meeting today. Um, 
What's the difference to GitLab and GitHub? GitLab and GitHub are repository hosting services. So those provide you additional services to use Git in a more efficient way and to share it in the internet um, with other people. Um, also Git itself has like a user interface, but it's not used that often because it's there, let's call, it's not ugly, but there are better solutions um, to it. If you want to understand um, the differences between GitHub and GitLab, I put down here um, a reference where I could have a short reading about it. And um, if you want to know much more in detail about version control, the differences, um, please follow the link here below. This is also actually the, the strategy in my talk today. A version control and how to use Git is quite a broad topic. So there are a lot of things that you can talk about. And I decided to um, try to melt it down to the most important points that if you are here today for the first time about Git and you would like to use it, or you just recently came across, which are the most important things to know. But Git, like R, is a never ending learning story. So. Um, I have a couple of resources and I try to add them um, everywhere where I think you could have. So please feel free to get back to the slides after this presentation and have a read here and then. What does it mean distributed version system uh, control system? Distributed means is that you have um, everyone who is coding and working on this has its own um, copy basically of the code. So everyone the full code all the time on its, uh, on its own local machine where to, to work on this. Great. Uh, we haven't talked about, I mean, if there are smaller questions, please feel free or maybe in the chat and the year I can um, point it out to me. So there so, is one question already. Yeah. Um, is there any full form of Git or is it just Git? I mean, is there any meaning or just some random noise? <laughs> Meaning a random noise. Uh, no, Git is Git. Um, I didn't get it. You mean the full name? What it means? Or yeah, I guess it it means what it, does it have a meaning or does it stand for something? I actually I never ask myself these questions. So I'm not aware of any meaning for it, so I would just assume it is a Git. Maybe someone else has more knowledge about this point. That's a good question. None, an unpleasant and contemptible person. <laughs> well, um, that's a nice interpretation. <laughs> yeah, I don't think they're related either. <laughs> like calling someone a git and GitHub, I, I don't think they're related. But we can we can hold on to that. <laughs> I will I will do some research about it. This is really a good question. I never. I mean, this was like okay, git, 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 but. I pointed out this first slide here, by the way around, because this got me very confused in the beginning, beginning. Some people were talking about GitLab, GitHub, and Git, and it was really like, oh, what the heck is going on? I mean, this version control, okay, topic is clear, but what to do then? So actually, all the structures, GitLab, GitHub, um, and so on. And then we have all these GUIs, so like Git Kraken, um, there are others, um, Git Tower and all these kind of um, things. So there are a lot of things, but in the background, this is Git that is used. Okay, so what are the exact advantages? How to deal with Git or using actually a version control? Um, I put down the, the reference on the slide, the Bitbucket, um, which I think summarized it pretty well. Um, conflict resolution, rollback and undo changes and offsite code backup. So in the end, these all are kind of additional uh, safety net layers to help you to keep your code working while um, developing new things and which makes things even more complicated with other people together. If multiple people contribute to the same thing if you would assume that you sit in maybe the same, you work in the same company, 
and you have a clearly uh, specified task. Okay, you develop this, you develop that. Then there's a certain level of communication. But in open source, and especially, and therefore I love so much the R um, community, is that the people can sit everywhere. And of course, you can have communication, but you have tools um, published on GitHub where a number of people can contribute to it. And it would be a shame if those contribution could not be acknowledged because they would just get a could get lost or um, the whole tool would break down because there are too many conflicts and nobody can deal with it. So Git provides in combination with the different um, GUIs or um, hosting services like GitLab and um, GitHub to enable conflict resolution, because this is, happens very often when multiple people working on the same things. There are small things that are different. And of course, it might be just the line of, and which is actually a comment, which is different. Or, um, But in this, at a certain point, you need the human being interaction to solve these conflicts. And to limit the amount of time that you need to spend to find those conflicts, you can use um, Git. So for collaboration, rollback and undo changes so that you can, if you break something, which also happens in every, uh, every now and then, that you are able actually to go back within a second so that you don't have to worry so much about that you, um, that you break something. And offside code backup, this is actually um, also quite a pretty nice use that you have somewhere a safety copy of your code somewhere. It's a repository that you can put on a, on a backup server and say, okay, whatever we do the next three months, there we have this copy of our repository, which will allow us to have exactly that state that we saved now there. So whatever breaks down, we have it there. Okay. So, Kristen, there are some questions yes. again. Um, sorry, just a second. Let me ask. So, one question is um, if I copy someone else's code and make some changes, would those changes be only in my code or that person's as well? I guess you would um, address this when point. you uh, do forks and stuff, like forking and all of that. Um, and another one, so uh, some of that question will be answered uh, later. Yeah. Come to it. And another question is, uh, can it be used as a sharing tool among team members? On the other hand, can it be used as an isolated environment? Maybe it is going to come in the future slides. Um, yeah. yeah. So there are like different possibilities and it's depending on the context I use, um, but I mean, I also come to that. Um, you can use those repository in very different um, ways. Um, so you, we, in my daily work, we use it as a, um, as a, yeah, every one of us has a repository or we clone this repository, how you would call it, um, but all to this terminology I come in the next couple of slides. So you would work on the same repository, sending your updates um, back and forth and continue to develop those two. On the other hand, we have a certain state of this repository we have on a server where the people in the lab would access it and they would just only work with those with this version that we, we so-called deploy there. So they don't necessarily see all those changes that we are doing um, meanwhile until we send them an update in form of um, that we push our update there and say, okay, this is now the new version basically. And now you work with this new tool. So there are different things. On the same side, um, at the same time, I have like a repository, like I said, on a backup server. So just for whatever thing. So I have one golden rescue copy somewhere. So if I lose a server, if I lose whatever connection, I can go there and pick up there my repository. In the worst case, put it locally and just continue working there. So whatever happens to my computational environment. So, but there are different, really different scenarios and um, you can do a lot of things, different things at the same time with the same repository. But this brings me exactly to this slide here. So repository, what is a repository? So a repository actually is just like a subdirectory in your folder where you code your project. 
but the repository refers also to the collection of files, code, um, data that you need for your tool. So your repository, or short also called repo, is basically your project folder where you have everything that you need in order to run your tool. So in this repository, um, in the subfolder dot git baby, all the changes are tracked that you make to your project and which is building up kind of a history over time. So meaning if you delete this subdirectory, you lose basically all your history. Most of the time this dot git uh, folder is hidden in the files and so you would even not see it actually. In some cases, and maybe on some systems you see it, but here on my Mac, I actually had to use a shortcut. I put the shortcut somewhere in the next slides that you can actually see this subfolder. Um, what you also have, so these repositories, we have most of the time two kinds of things. We have a local repository, which would be the copy of this repository on your computer or your laptop or um, where you actually work in code. And then you have remote repositories. You have remote repositories. But normally you have one which is kind of the central one, which is also referred to as the origin. Um, but you can have different remote repositories on different servers. There's no limit to the numbers. Also the same to the local repositories. So if 100 people work on the same code project, we would have 100 local repositories. There would all in the end, there are even more complex things sometimes, but they were all in the end back origin, uh, refer to the origin where every all the com, um, changes are combined would then go to this one remote repository, which is kind of, you could call the central one. If I, um, when you see something like this down here, git remote minus V, those are actually the commands that you can use in the command uh, line. They're popping up here and now and then, maybe after at the end of my talk, some are making a bit more sense to you and then you have uh, you can play them out. What is shown here is like a typical uh, git command. So you start with git and then it calls remote minus v. Remote is the command and minus v is the option. And what this option, if you um, type this in your command line when you are in the git project, it shows you actually all your remote repositories that um, you are connected to. But this more out of um, just for, for completeness on this slide. Um, let's talk quickly for what I use um, mostly GitLab in my daily work for. Um, as I said, I develop uh, scripts and tools to visualize data, to process data in a standard way. Um, I work with multiple people together, not all of them are in Toulouse, a few of them are in Hamburg, some are in Munich, uh, some are even in the States. So it's like a, a global thing, so people are not just sitting next to each other, we, um, we use GitLab for a lot of our communications and discussions actually about the code that we are working on. Um, what we also use GitLab and GitHub for is um, for sharing uh, the development of also our shiny um, applications, which comes even more than to the advantages of GitLab and GitHub for the uh, continuous deployment, but this is not a, a topic of today. But on the right side, I put a lot of uh, purple things. Um, why, uh, for what do I use? I just realized I forgot to start the timer. Stupid me, let's start this, okay. Um, so what we use also GitLab and GitHub for is code management, of course, the discussions, but we also track our issues. So if we have problems, we communicate those issues there. We um, split tasks and communicate those ones in GitLab. We also keep um, documents, which are just plain text files, keeping our um, meeting notes there. And now I need to move a bit things around. Um, it's also for training. So we put there like little um, documentations or like um, how to do's there. It is also for, for code revision. 
So those um, hosting services like GitLab and GitHub provide you a lot of um, opportunities to communicate uh, about your code with your team across the globe, which is actually quite amazing because you don't you do not rely on that uh, to keep track on emails and so on. It is like everything nicely lined up in the history um, in your GitLab or GitHub project, which makes sense because we are talking here about version control, which is nice, which is also quite a complicated thing and you need to keep track on all the changes that you do, and they do basically also the same for all your communications and teamwork. Um, it might, I think one difference, main difference between GitLab and GitHub is GitLab is often used in the corporate environment, whereas GitHub is um, very much used um, in, in the open source um, and data science field. So what is needed to get, uh, to use Git? So if you haven't downloaded it yet, you find the download here for the different distributions for your, your system. You can install it on your laptop, desktop, server, if you need some guides, please refer to those two here. These are my, my favorite references for this. Um, on the, I, I don't remember, um, there shouldn't be any issues. A couple of years ago, it was sometimes a bit troublesome, but I think nowadays it, the installation of this is quite uh, smooth. And actually besides downloading the maybe the, um, the, the, the package to install Git, you do not need any internet. You can just run after installation Git only on your laptop. You are not forced to put your repository in GitLab or GitHub. Version control itself can just also survive on your laptop with any contact to any other people. But of course, as soon if you want to exchange and collaborate, internet connection and most commonly a GitHub or GitLab account um, would be uh, yeah, would be needed. But that's all, the two, as the French would say. Um, there's a number of GUIs that we already quickly talked about it to make your experience a bit easier. Um, I put here the link to a number of one um, to, uh, to, where you have like uh, pros and cons and the first glance, how do they look like? Um, my actual favorite back then when I started was Git Kraken. And I already uh, saw that some would like, at least one person pointed out to use Git Kraken. Um, yeah, I really, I really like the design. All right. So today's story. Just to put a bit of context of um, what we, I would like to talk with you today. So just assume this little smiley here is Michelle. She loves data visualization and coding in R. And last week she has discovered the Tidy Tuesday, Tidy Tuesday community. I don't know if there's anyone around here who's also part of this community or following. I love this community. Unfortunately, I never really had much time um, to contribute to that. But if you're into data visualization and want to um, practice more R and get some um, nice um, inspiration. I put down here in the right button the link to this amazing um, community. But what is the concept is that every Tuesday a data set is published with a certain kind of topic. This topic can range from ice cream styles across Europe, it can be about moving. Uh, movies and their revenues, or it can be about politics or history. Um, based on this data set, then people start to visualize and try to extract interesting information. So, and this is what uh, Michelle started, um, decided, I want to contribute to this amazing community. And so she started with her first analysis and starts to code. After a while, she faces some problems and feels stuck. She uploads, uh, she uploads her code on GitLab and she discusses. Luckily, she has a friend, Clara, who's also part of this community and comes up with a fantastic solution. 
And luckily also Clara has a, a GitHub account. So they could easily, Clara could have access to her data, to Michelle's data, work on it and give back her feedback. And so they continue to work on this. And so and this is basically the story that I would like to, to communicate to you and enable you today after this talk that you have at least, maybe not everything runs smoothly, but you have an idea which steps are needed uh, to perform um, what are the main parts um, to use version control, Git and or GitHub in order to actively um, share code and discuss it with people? Because I think this is also one of the, the nice parts of this R community that is such a big community and you can always reach out to people helping you with, a, with an issue or giving you inspiration or work together. Um, so this is just this the story about the talk when you translate it and this is actually one slide um i didn't come up with a much better idea how it's like there so which would be when you translate this kind of procedure into a git language you would start okay michelle has a local repository so some set of files and data on your computer she does starts to work on it and she creates like certain snapshots um, she continues. She upload, upload this at a certain point um, to GitHub and Clara would retrieve this repository and then would continue to work based on Clara's code and to develop new things, would bring it back to GitLab, merge it together, also a very important term, um, together with Michelle's code and this would be basically the cycle. Um, so, but what's the deal with that weird bubble graph here now? So just in the following couple of slides, we go through a lot of uh, vocabulary and terminology as like any other language that you need to learn um, that there are some basic terms that they always come up. Please shout out in the chat if something is not understandable or not clear. So what in um, since Git is already quite abstract, a lot of workflows and procedures are like visualized in this form of um, bubble graph that I show here. So and the bubbles are referring to the commits and the commit means it's a snapshot of code changes that should be saved. So you start on the script and you do something and you say, okay, this I want to save now. Two hours later, you added another nice graph. You said, okay, this is perfect now. It's not the final product. I need another graph, but let's save this. So this would result in another bubble. At the next, just assume in the next bubble, something breaks all of a sudden. So, and those comments are the ones, the points in history that you could go back. So therefore this is, um, so the commits, the bubbles referring to the snapshots of the code changes where you could go back in the history. So this is like, uh, a picture of your code at a certain um, time point. And those bubbles are arranged on so-called branches. And this, the, every repository start with one a single branch. Depending if you um, use GitLab or GitHub, I just um, saw yesterday, this main branch is called main or master. Master is actually um, slowly, I think, due to political correctness, replaced um, by main in, the, in a lot of communities. Um, so, but this is the main and the main is like, okay, normally referred to as, so this is the branch where I would like to always have some, the code that is working. What to then do to develop to not break this main branch that is working, you create other branches. You can create branches to, um, to fix a bug, which is then normally called a bug fix branch, or to develop re uh, features. So at a certain point, you decide, okay, this is now the status, and I want to do now a major development, a new feature. Uh, maybe a module of your shiny application or a new normalization strategy. So in order to not work my running, uh, to break my running code, I will fork now my repository and just create a subcopy and 
continue to work now on this branch that is not any interfering with my main branch, which stays the same until I decide to merge it together. There are a couple of things coming up in the chat. Any questions? Yes. Um... Ah, yes. Yeah. So that branch be made main branch in future. You can decide at a certain point. It would be a discussion of if this is the best strategy, but you could decide that actually your dev branch is the one that should be deployed on the server and should be used. You could argue about um, it's maybe not the best strategy regarding software development agreement. Normally, you really have your one main branch, but of course, things can happen and can break and whatsoever, and there might be reason which are really related to the context that you're working for that you decide, okay, this is then the branch, which is the working one from now. I have never renamed uh, a branch, but you could do that. Sometimes people just then communicate, okay, please, this development, I mean, if you work in a bigger community, you would most likely then rename it or if you want to do so, but maybe there are also other strategies, but it's not um, possible, you can do that. Commit is a snapshot saved at cloud offset location. No, this is not. Um, the commit is basically as long as you work in your local repository, also on your local. But we're coming in a minute um, to this. So um, maybe let me, how was it called? Park the question here. Please raise the hand if it's not clear after the next slides. Because we're coming. Sorry, uh, just, yeah? I just want to also interfere, uh, interrupt, sorry, <laughs> quickly. No, and no. Say, um, there are a lot of people writing on the Google Docs, which you now can. Mm -hmm. um, but just to reiterate, um, Pusna, okay. I think you said you want to um, reply to these later, right? So if these are questions for the participants, if these are questions you want answered right away, um, rather just copy paste them in the chat and we can reply to them right away. Yeah. If um, it's not time sensitive, then Pusna will get to it at a later time point. Yeah. yeah. So we, we can be back for this. There's a very interesting, if you see a very interesting question, please just point them out also right now also. Yeah. Totally fine. It just, I know that it's sometimes a bit uh, tricky to get back to all the chat questions and go through. So I thought that this Google Doc might be an easier way for me than to go just um, step by step through it and add um, context. Yeah, so far there aren't a lot of questions on the Google Docs either. So maybe in a few minutes we can wait and then um, get to All those right. questions as well. Yeah. Okay, so let's split this workflow into pieces. Um, I split this part, um, those whole thing in four parts. Um, first, we start with how to set up a Git repository. Then we, how do we track changes in this repository? How do we, part three will be about how to collaborate in GitHub. And um, the fourth part is how to create a pull request. Um, so maybe the third and fourth part, they go hand in hand with each other, but I, um, I decided a bit to, to separate. Uh, to separate. What you see here are the most frequently used commands below each part. So if you are con if you want to get back, you find um, those commands explained in these parts. Okay, but maybe we can refer to some of the questions in the Google Doc and then have a short break, a very short break. Shall I open the Google Doc or do you it's want to read out? Let's see. Where did I? Here we go. All right. If it's worth learning Git, if I code alone, I'm the only person working my script because I'm ready to my PhD. Definitely, because especially with PhD students, they always crash and something gets lost or breaks when you are almost done. <laughs> On my own experience. So even for, um, yeah, it is totally worthy because also, when you work alone on your code, maybe sometimes um, you want to go back in time and get back to a different state or just, yeah, you lost something. So it's totally fine too. And I think 
it is even um, for the learning curve at the beginning it's also quite nice actually to use git first of all on your own and play around with it um, to work immediately in a team of three and four can sometimes be a bit intimidating so um, if you want to learn it if you have some um, if you work with code i would definitely recommend it do we have other questions here what is the best approach when you need to move a pool in your local directory? I've encountered variations of error below many times. Uh, yeah, so this is a uh, one classical um, thing. Maybe I can get back to this with some references in a bit more detail later. Is there a way locally view snapshot files from a past comment? Yes, definitely. We will have a look at this. Um, there are different ways to do. Um, basically, when we come to the point where we use this command um, git checkout, um, this is used to, to that you can check out a certain commit of your repository, and then you can run the code and see the graph actually there. All right. What's the main difference between pulling, pushing, and merging? We're covering this in the next couple of slides. Anything else? Maybe refreshing. Okay. So let me get back to you. Why is this always happening? Okay, so if maybe I can, we can pull it in the, in the chat quickly. Where's my chat? Here's my chat. Um, who has, um, is there anyone who would like to finish the creation of a GitHub account who has not a Git installed on his laptop? Because then I would like to invite to do this during this little break. You don't have Git installed from it, so you might would like to use our Studio Cloud. Do you have a GitHub account? Perfect. Then maybe just head to our Studio Cloud and try to log in there. Um, Kristen, I'm not sure yeah. if a lot of people have Git installed because um, the instructions were to make a Git, make a Git account, so. Um, yeah, yeah, you can go, let's, maybe let's go uh, together. So you can, you don't, um, oh, let me log out. So you just go to um, rstudio.cloud uh, and here in the login option, it's a bit hidden, you can log in with your GitHub account, basically, and then, we can um, start when we come to the live coding part. I will show you um, how to, to start here a project. And then you have basically a perfect setup R Studio uh, where you can play around with the Git. OK, so maybe are there other, other, other concerns? Happy complacent life. <laughs> All right. Okay. What's the time now? Oh my gosh. Maybe we skipped the break. It's already 10 to you. Okay. Okay. Let's take a deep breath and we just dive into. I should talk less more precise. Okay. Part. One, how to set up a Git repository. Um, there are two ways to start. There are more ways to start, but two ways that I would like to introduce you. So those are the main ways. So one way is you have a local folder with your code project and you would like to make this a Git repository. So you would use the command git init most likely on the command line or in, in your local R studio. 
there's another way where you see, oh, this is a nice GitHub repository, uh, repository. I want to work on this and want to clone it. So you navigate to your GitHub account in the repository, you copy the address, um, navigate to your directory and create those copy either in the command line with git clone and repo address or what we're going to do now in a second, we use the RStudio um, cloud. Um, so let's have a look. So we have to the sake of time, let's stick to our studio cloud. I provided, sorry, I switched too fast. Um, I will put this in the chat. So this is a GitHub repository that I um, prepared for today. It's like a, a small repository only with a readme and one R script um, file. So what we want to do is that we would like to copy this repository to your R Studio that you can start to work with. Let's go um, to the R Studio Cloud. I already showed you how to log in. I hope for everyone who has no Git installed, this is um, possible. So and here you can start a new project. You go to new project from a Git repository. And then you basically copy the address. So there's one big green button, all the important things are green. There you can copy the address of your repository, which is normally a combination of um, so the, the hosting service GitHub, the username, and then the repository name. So you basically copy those address here, click OK. And what is happening in the background is actually exactly the command git clone. So it makes a copy of this repository here now in the cloud environment, not locally, but in your R Studio. So if you are in the familiar with the command line, why doesn't it pop up? So here we go. What we have here now are those files. In addition, there are some other files. So we have to read me and the script that was just here on the, on the repository a second ago. We have here the terminal that we are going to use quite frequently for the command line to use um, Git. So this is the most easiest way to copy. Oh yeah, there are some packages not installed. <clears throat> not that important, um, to clone a repository to a working environment where you can start to work um, with. If you check, if you in your terminal, in your command line type git, if you have git installed, this is also an easy way how to check if you have git installed, you can just um, type git and then there should be the help page coming up. If we would like to, oh, sorry, I have to close the videos here. Um, if I would like to see which remote repositories are available, I just type this command git remote minus v and here you can see the origin. So the, the actual central uh, environment um, repository refers to this address there I just um, copied it from. So GitHub, my username and our ladies um, git training. So this was the first part. If you are in, in your local R studio. You have, um, I'm sorry, I have here the terminal on this side. It works exactly the same as in the, in the, in the cloud. For the next um, couple of minutes, uh, for, the, for the slides, I would um, do all the, the typing here so that hopefully you can, can follow me. Are there any questions to this part? Maybe what I could do is not this one. So just assume that I create, um, does anyone want to know to start from a local folder, how to initiate a repository? Yes, please. Okay. So I am here on my documents. I create just a folder that I call test 
git um, init. So I created this one. I open a terminal and let me increase the size that you can read it. Um, so I will go to documents and test. So you have to navigate to your folder. And all what you need to do actually is now to type git in it. And then it tells you initialize empty git repository in users, um, username, documents, test git in it. And here you see also dot git folder. When you check here in this folder, you see now, let me also increase, does this increase? No, I mean, but maybe you can see here. So here's a bit faded, um, this hidden subdirectory. And this is all what you need to do. If you start from the local one, you have to define, if you want, you want to share it in a GitHub, you have to define this um, remote repository though. So this is the advantage to start from GitHub that you create there a repository, then you clone it. Um, maybe we can do also this. So let me create another folder. So test two. Let me go back, CD, well, documents, test two. And now I want to get uh, clone the repository on the command line. Um, I have the, I take this address. There are different ways. There's HTTPS and SSH. For the beginning, please use HTTPS. SSH has some advantages with user credentials, but the easiest way is, um, is the HTTPS. You copy the address, and then this is all what's happening. It's saying cloning our ladies git training. It counts the objects, and that's all. And when you check in our folder in test two, we have now the repository, so which is the folder name, and my two scripts, so the readme and the script box plot. Are there any questions? Would be a pity if we miss at the beginning how to start. All right. So those are the two options that we can go through to start. When you've started the first time uh, with Git, introduce yourself to Git. Define your username. Um, that you have in Git and also your e user email address with these com uh, commands, git config minus minus global and the username user email with a minus minus list or dash dash list, you can have a look at all the users that are set up. One remark, this um, dash dash global defines the setting for all of your Git repositories on your local machine. There might be cases where you don't want to do that. So then just skip this part, this minus minus global, and define each uh, the username and user email for each repository separately. How to track changes in my repository? There are four commands that are very important, which is git add, git commit minus m, git status, and git lock. And here we come to this um, development environment and um, how this is organized. So this is maybe the one of the most complicated uh, slides that I have right here. And um, let me try to navigate to you. So what is shown here is the local development environment. Therefore, I put here the screen. So this is actually happening all on your laptop. In your project folder, so maybe what I just called test two or which has the repository name, um, we have actually three different areas. They are not really locally separated areas, but um, it is like a file gets a certain tag when it moves from the working directory to the staging area and then to the final local repository. What is included in your working directory? In your working directory are all the files. Those ones that are already tracked by Git, so where any change is recorded that you then add in those bubbles along your branch. And you also have untracked files. So maybe 
there are a number of files that you sometimes never want to track because they are automatically generated output files, they are log files and so ever. So those stuff you might not want to track. And back then later in the slide, we come to the point what you could do with those slides to um, make the, the command line users a bit cleaner. In order to move um, a file or changes in the file, um, to the local repository, you do two steps. You first, you add it to the staging area, and then you commit this to the local repository um, with the message. Um, git add, it doesn't mean to start to track the file. It means to add those changes that have been done before to uh, monitor these and to keep this in mind. You can add multiple files, one after the other, or all together to the staging time, um, and then perform a commit to add this to the local repository. Or not to add, it's a bad terminology, to move it to the uh, terminology. So this commit basically creates the bubble in your local repository. And this bubble refers to the snapshot um, of your code. So you can run this add command quite a couple of times. It does not have to be that you run git add and git com uh, commit subsequently all the time. No, this is not um, needed. You can add a file, you can work on the next code of chunk, uh, chunk of code, and you can then add it. And um, normally, you combine all the files of a functional unit into a commit so that all the changes that refers to a, sp a specific task or feature or um, part of the code that you want to modify in a single, um, single commit together. So if you think about it, okay, this is a snapshot in the bubble. If you need, you should include all the files that are changed, which are like a functional relation to each other. Um, once you want to maybe to come back in history to this exact point that you have all the files that are working together, um, that they are in place. In the git add command, um, there are some options to it. If you run git add dot, um, it takes all the changes that are present in your working directory and add those to the staging area, or you use the dash dash or. What I would recommend is to use git add and then the file name. So we'll, and then you have a space and you can add another file name. Um, so you can uh, concatenate multiple file names one after the other to add multiple files at the same time. But I much more would recommend um, to have a very controlled way what you add. With the git add dot or dash dash all, you might add things that you just not see because your code repository could grow quite big and then maybe you just um, miss and actually you add a file that you just um, didn't, um, changes in a file that you just didn't want to track. And you can also add complete folders and directories um, to the staging area. The git commit minus m and then with a commit message is a quite important because this commit message gives you the possibility to um, two months later or even two weeks later to understand what you actually have performed or what is covered in this bubble on your branch. Without this message, you only have uh, like um, letters and numbers, which have, so every commit has an ID. Um, that you could refer to. With the message, also other people could uh, follow much better and understand what or which changes have been done. Um, and then after this is done, you at a certain point, whenever you decide to share all your changes, you can push this to your remote repository to GitHub or GitLab. Also, this push command, it does not have to uh, come up after every commit. You can collect multiple commits and push them um, together. There are quite a bit of recommendations about this commit message. Um, I put here a link down there. And I think also in my last slide, I have a, a couple of, um, or at least one article um, 
elucidating a bit more detail why and how a good commit message um, would uh, look like. Susan, we have questions again. Um, in general, would you recommend working with the command line instead of using an application like GitHub Desktop for managing the repositories? I think this is very depending what you prefer. I have to say I started to use Git on command line. Um, I had some colleagues um, that I also um, trained in and they prefer to, to use GUIs and it's um, easier. I think this is really up to personal taste. I think if you are very, it might be intimidating in the beginning, but I think the command line is a very clean and nice way to really follow what is happening. I have the impression with all the GUIs, you click on buttons and there are a lot of options and some are automatically checked, but you might not want to have. So I, from, from my point of view, it's sometimes even more um, crowded than what I, um, yeah and complicated to understand what's actually happening in the a, in a, in a background. But this is really up to personal um, taste. And um, why is it that RStudio Cloud shows more files in the clone folder than in the clone used in terminal? We come a second. No, 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 no. Here we go. Um, let us have a quick look. No, this is something else. I'm gonna go here. So I come to those files here. So um, since we work in our studio and um, we opened a project, we have also this R project and we have those two files, the dot R history that covers all the, the changes and tracks that you do and this dot uh, git ignore file. We come in a minute to it. Here you actually can save or um, define those files um, that should not be uh, taken care of during, um, which are not tracked basically. Those changes are not tracked. As I said, it might be log files. It might be um, if you run a script and it creates graphs in a PDF, but you don't want to have these um, compiled output um, in, in your version control because it's just the result of your code, but it's actually not related to, to your code. This is what you can do here, but we come to this in a minute. Oh, but I have to practice this in a better way. Yeah, we go. Are there any other questions regarding git add and commit? Okay. Two commands that are very important, maybe even more important um, than, no, maybe not more important, but git status and git log. Those two commands are the best ones because they do not change anything in a repository, but they show you what is actually going on in your repository. So git status shows you which files have been modified, uh, which are tracked, which changes are untracked. And you just basically type git status. I even don't know if there are any options. Um, I don't think so. This is just git status. We um, do this in, in a second um, in, in the RStudio project. And we have uh, git log, which um, displays all the snapshots, so all the commits that you have done. Um, those command, uh, this command has quite a lot of options to make it a bit easier readable in, in the terminal. Um, you can browse through this git log to find a certain commit to search for specific changes. Um, and it doesn't induce any changes either. So those two commands you can run and you would not modify or change anything. Um, there are some possibilities to modify. So git log minus n shows, and then in digit, um, here it's three, would show you the last three commits um, you can summarize those commits in like a one line output, you can have some statistics, and you can even have a log with a graph, um, and those, those then decorate and one line come together here. Maybe let me check my next slide. Okay. 
Um, actually, let's go to our studio cloud. Where's my mouse? There we go. So what we have here, can you read everything? Maybe I can make it a bit bigger. Can I close this? Yes, perfect. So what, um, so let's type git status. So what, let me increase this. So what you see here now, okay, you are on the um, branch called main. And this is up to date with origin main. So referring to the state of our remote repository, which is called origin. We actually, we do not have any untracked files here. I mean, we have this git ignore and this project uh, dot r project, but this is not related to our code. And git actually tells you nothing added to the commit, but, um, but those two files, if I would like to um, track those changes, please use git add. But actually, I don't want to check this. I will modify the readme. Uh, I will say um, today uh, it's a sunny day in Toulouse. Sorry, my typos, but so, and I would save it. If I go now back in the console and type git status, it actually tells me. You modified the README. And it also says here, those changes um, are not staged for commit. I should use um, git add and um, that it will be staged and that I can later on then add those um, changes to a commit to our snapshot of our repository. So I wanna do that. So I say, okay, git add, and then I just type readme.md. Now I check in git status again. And now it turns into green. It says, oh, cool. You, this and this green means, okay, it's modified, but this is uh, tracked now, this is stage. And if I want now to say, okay, actually I don't need to modify the readme. I mean, it's a lousy readme, but okay, um, we don't. I would say git commit minus M, quotation marks would say, I just added here a sentence. This is not the definition of a very good um, commit message, but just as an example, how to run this command. And then that's all. What it tells me here, and this might happen to you also when you work, um, it tells you, please tell me who are you? So I will write now git config. Actually, the messages that Git is giving you are quite nice. This was different back then when I started. So say christianrladies.org and git config type global username. This is my username. This is set with the cursor up, I can go through the history and say, okay, another try, git commit. And now it says, I just added here a sentence to the main branch. And this is this ID, um, this, there's a particular meaning, but this should not be part of today. So this is the ID of our commit. So if I check now git status, I'm back. So to what we, where we started. So everything that has been changed in the readme is now committed. So this is now ground zero again, everything is fine. If I modify now something again, I would um, add this stage this, uh, add this file to the staging area and then commit this. If I check in the git log, I actually get this output. So there are a number of, um, of logs here um, because I, I procured a few uh, few things. If you on the utmost, you have the latest commit. 
There you have here the commitment message. I just added here a sentence. You have the information of the author and you have the date and you have actually a quite uh, extended ID of, of your commit. And this head refers to, this is the last commit of your main branch. If you have something like this, you have this double point here. This is because of the editor that is used. You have to type Q and then you are back in the terminal um, uh, command line version. If you would write git log um, and then it was one line, it would summarize all the git commands in really one line. So here, just the ID. And then I just added here a sentence before it was like a merge request that I performed um, before I added another feature, which I, um, where the commit message was extended the graphs, modified some packages and so on. So this is the, the history. And you can go back to any state of this using those IDs here. But let's get back if there are not any questions. Let me check the chat. Just one question, if the commands are case sensitive. Yes. Yes, it is. So you actually really have to um, write normally. Um, let me. Normally, it's like this, and then you press tab, it auto completes also things, which makes it um, easier to avoid um, typos. If you type any file name that Git does cannot find, it will let you know. It says, oh, this doesn't exist. So if I would do, what is it, MD, um, it would tell you, read me, MD did not match any file. So this, you know, okay, you have a typo. You do not use Git tab in R Studio. No, this Git tab in RStudio is kind of an interface um, that would be nice. And actually, I'm not the expert and best person to introduce this. This tab is not working, the Git submit. Uh, our tab is not working for the auto completion. I guess the auto completion. So for this, I um, please drop maybe a message in the document and I will link you to a nice blog post where this is in a bit more detail to explain how to use it. You can do everything that I'm explaining here on the command line also here. Okay. You're welcome. All right, getting back to the slides. Oh. All right. So maybe you have a play around with those commands. Um, I put here also a reference where you have a lot of um, options that you can explore. All right. What is Git ignore doing? So here we can, as I already said, we can track. Um, so no, from the beginning. So we can have in our working environment directory, can we can track and undirect files, but also files that we might want to ignore, like binary files, files that generated at runtime, like log files, build output directories, or hidden systems files. And sometimes you want to exclude and delete permanently because you know, oh, all these PDF outputs, they, so this git status can get very long. If you have a long number of files and they are already updated uh, with every time you run your code, you will all have them in this long list. So where you, uh, list and it, you need to scroll a lot. So you want to like, okay, no, just ignore those ones. And this is what you can put um, there. And by default, when you use RStudio, there are those files already included, which would not be included in the tracking. So, and therefore not listed when you call git status. Um, there is no real function to modify this git ignore. So you cannot say, are like git add ignore this file. No, you would go need to go uh, manually to this file. Well, here we go. So you just click on it and then you type in it. It's just a text file. Oops, Allah. That's what we didn't want. 
sometimes something is a bit off here in my browser. Maybe with the zooming, some things. Can you still read it? Um, you can include cache files in the skipping or files. So if I would have a folder, which I would, um, um, so if I know that my code would create a number of PDF files that I never want to include, I would, so you can use also white cards. You can put star dot PDF. If you have a folder um, that you wanna ignore, you can just, Right, catchy. Once if this is the directory name, so and this and the content would then be be excluded. Ah, the files are like the temporary cache. Um, cache files. And so not uh, not really cache files. These are just files that you don't want to drag. I don't know. Um, if I. <laughs> So, Christian, what happens is whenever you are, uh, whenever you're working on something, right, till the time you do not completely work upon it, so there's always a temporary file which is embedded into the system. Uh, is it? It is something like that. So, if you're downloading something from Chrome, let's say for example, till the time yeah. the download completes, there would be of that same size, there would be a temporary file which is downloaded, and it, you you cannot do anything if if you break that download in between. That file is useless. You need to yeah. download the entire file. No, you can. If uh, you can, as I said, you can also define those file types. I, I'm not sure. I never had this um, issue, so I think this cache file have a certain file type, and you can define this file type also here to exclude it from um, to be ignored. So like um, star dot tmp or something like this or anything that starts with temporary so tmp star this would um to, there i can drop in the um include i think also in the in my backup references there is a um a reference to this um there there are really a lot of options so because it can get really in the end you might want to track maybe 20 files, but you want to exclude like 200 files. So therefore there are a lot of options how to define what to ignore and so on. But um, yeah, <laughs> you're welcome. And somebody said, bye. Bye, Diana. Nice that you have been part of it so far. Okay, let's go back. So I am maybe here. This is the reference. Please have a look there. And um, there are a lot of great examples what you can do. I'm pretty sure that with these um, temporary files, there are also options to manage this in a perfect way. So there's one command that we could really talk a lot about it. I decided uh, for the sake of time to just mention it here. So of course, sometimes, so just imagine you worked on the file and then you want to know what actually has been changed to your previous snapshot. And this you would use with a git diff. Um, this command has a lot of options. Um, if you just use it in this plain way as it's written here, it always compares what is right now in your working directory to the last snapshot. So if we go in an example here, um, sunny day to lose, but oh, something is really off here. Um, but in Berlin, it is raining. I actually don't know, haven't talked to anyone today, but let's assume something like save it. I go to git status and then it tells me, oh, I modified it, but then I don't have this file open anymore because I closed it back then. I just had a coffee and went, okay, but actually did I change? Then you would write git diff. And then it would tell you something like this. Ah, yeah, by the way. So this was what's held before. Here I removed, um, ah, I included boo here. Okay, so the red part minus is what I, ex what is, removed and for this we have now those two green lines 
and there's no nine at the end of the file. So this is basically how we can see diff. I don't use diff, uh, git diff that often in the terminal because it's much easier to track those things directly in, in GitHub, which um, I think is a better, better experience. We are going to show and um, to have a look at this uh, when we come to this point. Okay, perfect. So as maybe just to, to summarize, so as I said, here in the GUIs or GitLab, GitHub, it's much nicer platform to evaluate the differences between commits and your, your things. Um, and additions are normally shown in green and um, code deletions in red. And this is one point um, where I'm always wondering color blindness did not reach this part of the programming community. Um, yeah. So maybe a mini task and a mini break of um, five minutes uh, where I would like to um, have a look. I don't know, maybe we can have a short survey in the chat if you have managed to uh, clone this repository in our studio cloud. Could you give me a short feedback? And if you would like to have five minutes to work on your own, so to create a new file, add a few lines, save it, check the status and create a commit. Or do we want to keep this mini task for an exercise afterwards? Maybe Diva, what do you say? Maybe of the sake of time? Or... Yeah, I was about to say we have around 30 minutes. Yeah. Time is flying. Yeah. Okay. So maybe we keep this as a mini task if you uh, for like a homework after uh, presentation. Um, have a look at this. Try to follow the step. You find actually those solutions. I will. Um, share like a workflow of Git commands also um, later after. Okay, little break. We skip this break. How to collaborate in GitHub? Um, to collaborate, it's um, the best way to use branches. So we come across the command git branch. We also need to uh, use the command git checkout. We will use git or see git merge with a very important options that I really use all the time exactly like this. Um, dash dash no minus FF, which means like no fast forward, but I'm going to explain this on a particular slide. And then we have two commands, which are sometimes a bit mixed, intermixed with each other. It's git fetch and git pull with a remote name. Um, so the concept of branching, here's a lot of text and a lot of references. Um, the concept of branching is this, the concept of Git. And it has those advantages that I already pointed out, um, that you are able to keep a, a copy of your code, which is um, often referred to as in production, on the side while working actually on the code, further developing and adding things. And this is pointed out here in this picture on the right. Um, sometimes you find also in the literature and the web pages referred to as a Git uh, flow um, model. So here, this is um, still an old version. So we have a master branch. And this master branch refers to the copy that is in production where everything is working. But we can also see that we have a number of other branches and bubbles going on here. So we have a hotfix branch, a release branch, a develop branch, and feature branch. Um, the most commonly what you have, um, if you start to work on a bit bigger project than just like modifying a readme file or one R script file, you would create a develop file. And then you would only work on this develop, uh, uh, not file, branch, pardon, uh, on a branch. And then you would start, and therefore you have here all these bubbles, which reflects changes in the code. And from this develop branch, you would create another branch in order to maybe um, develop a long-term feature, or here this was a very small feature, and then you would merge it back into your develop branch and, and so on. 
sometimes. Um, so this, I pointed out this picture here because those names that you have here for the branches are very, very classical and used throughout the community. So the master or main branch for the code of copy that is in production, the develop branch where actually everyone is working on and every user is basically creating another copy to develop features. There are hotfix branches, which is like, like a small bug fix that needs to be done immediately and um, also release branch. All these types of branches follow automatically connected to these are a number of rules or actions what or functions what you're supposed to. And um, there's one post uh, which I really, really enjoyed. It was one of the first posts that I read is when I started to work and use Git in a bigger context than only for my own files. And this is this one here. It got an update after 10 years later, but what is pointed out there is still solid and valid at all. There are some other um, articles also, um, which explaining in more detail the different mode of actions for each of those um, branches. Okay, what did I write here? Okay, this is the most important part that we have here. Does it have to be that complicated? No, it's really depending um, and up to you what you want to achieve and what is sensible in, in the context of, of your project. What I would always recommend is to have your master or main branch and develop branch. And from this develop, you create your features. Because it has the possibility that what you can see here, and therefore I put this picture here. So independently from what is going on on your develop branch here and with the purple bubbles, and the features that is going on, this code in the master, which might be on the server and used by scientists in the lab, is not changing. It is stable, it is running, it is doing its job. And here on this side, the bioinformaticians can play around and uh, develop things. Um, there are certain, um, I mean, you should, if you work together with some people or sometimes um, for, you find also in the readme of repositories where it's described <clears throat> the agreements, how to deal with certain branches. Therefore, have a look if you start to contribute to a repository on GitHub, have a look in the readme and um, see uh, which, um, which rules the maintainer or the maintenance team uh, pointed out how to deal with those. So basic suggestions for me, keep a main and a develop branch. The main reflects all the time the working in production state and you work on the develop branch and create a feature branch from there. So the parent branch of each feature is basically the develop branch. You never start, you could start from the master, but you never do. You just always, and these are the small rules. If you stick to these rules, you will have a much cleaner, um, Git his, history in, in your project. So every feature starts from the um, develop branch. Every feature that is finished is also merged back into develop branch, not directly into the master, because you would interfere with your um, code that is in production, but you even haven't tested it. So you merge it into your develop branch, and then you have time here to test it and to check if really is everything fine. And once you're really 150% sure, um, you would push those um, updates into, into your master branch. And normally you would always start, so here um, um, you have two features. One feature started maybe in May, and then in June, there was another idea of another colleague, but this colleague, but in between there were further develop, other smaller de uh, developments, but then a colleague with a new idea in June started then from the most recent version of the develop branch. It wouldn't go immediately um, back. This all works out. But those rules and agreements are mostly um, discussed within the team and then laid out. Kristen, just a minute. There was still um, a question mm -hmm. that was probably not clarified. Yes. Uh, which is the final version then, the main, uh, the master branch or the developed branch? Um, so I have to say, I'm also a bit puzzled about this 
version 0.2. I think this is just a typo in, in the picture. Um, don't I see? Yeah, and so I think this is just a typo. So there's no no connection or maybe they, they missed something. I would assume so here's only, since there's no interference with the develop branch, the master branch stayed all the same. So there was also no, no change of uh, version numbering. Does this clarify this question? So in this image, which is the final file, the main or yeah, the dev? Thing? So. Um, so this one you can see here, this is a bit ahead. So we have here some developments which are still not present there because for this, the development, so you could say referring to the, what the user is seeing is this one. Referring to the developments, this one is the, the most recent and update one, but the users are not seeing those changes until you merge, until you combine those ones here. All right. So branching in a nutshell. So we have those three most important um, commands. We have git branch. Git branch doesn't do much. It does some things. It lists all the branches that you have in your project. So we just learned you can have multiple uh, branches. You, can, you use this command for creating branches and also modifying the names of branches. I put here the most uh, important ones. So git branch that shows you which branches are present minus a shows you all the remote branches because also your colleagues or teammates could um, add branches and push them to the repository and you might be interested oh what is actually the state of uh, michael's uh, branch that you just talked about the last week and to create a branch you would type git branch and then a branch name and the branch naming actually follows also very much the, um, as before. So you would have like feature X, Y, Z, feature whatsoever, bug fix um, with the date or bug fix five, which is referring then in your GitHub um, issue list to a particular issue that was pointed out there and so on. So I have normally also the naming of the branching is very much discussed um, because it's important it, if, if there's a consistent structure of naming, it is much easier to navigate through all those branches. And the branching of a project can get pretty wild. To delete a branch, which is therefore also a very important command, you would do git branch minus D and then actually the branch name behind the minus D. Sorry, this is a typo, I will correct this. Yeah, Kristen, there's another question. Uh, can one person's last developed branch bubble be used by another person as a main branch? Um, yes, one, no, not really as a main branch. The person could pull this branch and continue to work there, if this is what it means. Exactly, right. So if, if you could please go back to the previous slide. So there were, there were a couple of bubbles which ended up to probably... Uh, okay. hmm? So let's say if, if I take the last green bubble and the lowest uh, uh, yeah, branch, so can I copy anyone, copy this one and use this as the main branch? Yeah. If yes, then how would me as a second person identify which is that bubble which I need to use? Um, this you can see in the history, basically. So because it would point if you go to this branch, you would always start with the last commit. So this so goes the latest there. one would be there. Yeah, it will be there and also the complete history would be there. And then with git log for this branch, you could check which logs are there and then you can go even to a particular log. So this is um, this is possible. I just would not call it main branch. It's just like you can continue to work on there. As soon as the person um, sends, pushes this branch to the GitHub repository, it can, another person can basically download, pull, this branch and also continue to work there and you can start to work together on this branch it's okay. a bit tricky it can turn out into something complicated but if it's this is possible 
Okay, and actually I already used this command or told about uh, this git checkout. So with git branch, you create and modify and delete branches, but to actually move to a branch, um, you need to use git checkout. And this is git checkout. And then for instance, the branch name feature underscore X. If you want to go back to your main branch, you just type git checkout main. Um, maybe very shortly to this git merge. So the git merge is when you want to actually you finish the development on the feature brand and you want to incorporate those changes into your main branch or let's call it in this case, the better way would be the develop branch. Then you would use git merge uh, minus minus no minus fast forward <coughs> and um, then the branch name. Um, you. But maybe a few words. I mean, you have also a link here to more details, and also the uh, next slide will maybe clarify a bit more. Um, this no no first forward means um, that you have all the all the uh, commits that you have added during working on your feature branch will remain will be present. If you do not add this minus minus no minus forward, those ones are squashed into a single bubble. So you would cannot go in this sub history of your feature branch anymore. Um, so therefore, I really like to use this um, option for this git merge command because then you still are able to go even back in your feature branch at certain points in history. But you find more details also here. Um, so imagine we have cloned a repository and you want to add a new feature, new script, new graph. So what you would do, so you would go to your repository, you go to the master branch, be following good practice, we switch to the develop branch or create a develop branch if not present. In the develop branch, then we start a new fe feature branch from those one on this feature branch we would add our new code, validate the code, commit, uh, add and commit our changes. And then once we have finished, we want to merge this feature brand into develop branch. Here on the right side, I put uh, summarize um, basically the, um, the command line history. So just assume we open the RStudio project, we go to the terminal and we just make sure that we are on the master or on the main branch, git checkout master. Then we said, oh, okay, we, we actually don't have a develop branch. Let's create a develop branch, follow the good practice. So we would create with Git branch, develop this branch. And then we could go there physically to this develop branch. And then we say, okay, or based on the develop branch, we create a feature X branch. And those two commands that you have here can be combined into a one line command here which combines the creation of feature X and uh, to immediately move to this branch, which is then git check out this option minus B and then the feature branch name. You would work on your code once you are done in different stages, depending on the complexity, you add uh, the changes that you have done on your new script and you commit them. Once you are done, you would go to git checkout develop, and then you would call git merge no first forward and the feature branch name. And with that, you would basically create something like this. So we move from the master to the develop branch, from the develop branch to feature branch, worked on our code, and then combined it back to our develop branch. Are there any questions to this part? Let's have to check. I don't understand. Um, no fast forward. Okay, no fast forward. Let me, maybe we can go back to this graph here. Sorry, to this one here. Um, if so, here at this point is a merge. Also, here the no fast forward option was used. If you 
would not use this no fast forward option, you would not see anymore those two bubbles here. This is the thing. And there would be only one bubble. Um, and you cannot, I mean, yeah, it would be one bubble. You would not see the two bubbles. And if you, you can have in the feature like three, four, uh, 10, 100 bubbles, there would be all combined in one bubble. So if you would like to go back to this feature branch and go step to your evolution of the script, you would not be possible if you would not use the no fast forward function. Does this make it a bit clearer? Yes or no? Okay. Perfect. So, good practice advice. Um, just assume that you are not only working alone on your Git repository, but you have two other friends that are working with you on this. And then maybe they worked last night quite long, they had a good idea, and um, they pushed new updates to the remote repository. It is always a good practice before you start to work on a new feature so that you create a new branch that you fetch and pull the recent updates because then you start with actually the, the, the working, the latest or the most recent um, version of the code. And if um, to forget about this, this might happen in the beginning quite often. It still sometimes uh, happens to me. Um, creates the like fifty percent of the merging issues or errors or Git error messages that you have. So just keep in mind. Um, I put in the in the in the last slide a number um, some articles which talk about it. Maybe let me point out um, two important differences between git fetch and git pull. So git fetch is a very safe version. So you do not change anything in your working directory like git status and git log. And what it does, it basically looks in your remote repository what is present there. But it does not immediately take everything and merge it into your local um, repository. This is the difference to git pull. And then remote, you would say git, uh, git pull origin or a certain branch. So it checks for those updates and immediately integrates them into your local repository. So git pull is actually the combination um, of um, both commands. Um, I don't say don't use git pull. Um, I use it um, quite often, but sometimes you just might want to have a, have a look what actually um, is there. And you might want to pull only a certain branch and not, um, not everything and so on. Um, but it's a good practice before starting to work on a feature to run, um, normally I run first a git fetch to have a look and then a git pull maybe on a particular thing or um, on the complete, um, maybe sometimes uh, yeah, often on the develop branch because from there I would start the next feature. Okay, the last point how to create a pull request. Because this is the part and how we can make our modifications visible to the outside world, how we move those changes um, to the GitHub repository. And the concept of the pull request is not only to make other people aware of the share, uh, changes in the code and to share it with the people, it is also, um, so it serves actually as like also a notification, this pull request. But it also helps um, gives you, especially using GitHub and GitLab, and actually this pull request is like, or merge request, how it's called in GitLab, is like a tool provided by those um, hosting services, is to explain your change, changes, to discuss uh, with your collaborators. And uh, you can even add screenshots there. So this is like the communication platform where you, um, also ask for the revision of your code and 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 so forth. Um, the pull, Rick. Um, wait, wait, wait. What did I write down here? Um, so the this is maybe important, which I referred in the beginning to. Um, 
the where does when you use the command git push then you refer to the remote uh, name and then you can add also um, a particular feature uh, branch name for instance feature x in this case so you can also you don't have to push all of your changes or your complete local repository no you can particularly select your new developed feature branch that you want to share with the outside world and then you would call the command git push remote name which is most of the cases um, origin and then your feature x branch where does those changes go this is normally automatically defined when you start with the git clone approach in the beginning if you use the git init approach so from the command line just having a folder and um, get, uh, initialize a repository there you need to define um, your your um, remote um, origin basically but this is also command line this is what it also referred here in those references um, after you executed the git push command on the command line you have two options to actually create this pull request so what i put here um, is basically the output from the terminal so i performed git push origin feature code 2 so it moved all those things and then there are some messages here and then there's written create a pull request for feature code 2 on github by visiting this link so basically you can actually click on this link and um, your web browser opens and opens for you like a starting page where you can put all the information on the next slide i'll show you how this looks like but what you also can go is to just perform this and maybe you have to leave for, for your gym session or whatsoever. And in the evening, you actually want to finish um, and start this pull request um, to inform all your collaborators. You can also go to the GitHub repository page and there will be a notification to finish actually what you pushed and to create this um, pull request. And this is what it uh, looks like. So here on this Our Ladies Git training, um, I pushed here this feature code two, and then they have I have here this green button compare and pull request, and this opens then this um, menu basically, where you have your your latest commit message, where you can leave more um, extensive comments, what you have done. You can link screenshots or link references. You can use this uh, Arabos, um, Arabos? Yeah. The, the ad to refer to people. You can request revision. You can assign people to have a look. You can define labels and so on. And then you click on create pull request and all this information will be available to everyone who's visiting um, your, your Git um, repository. I have seen a number of questions. Uh, no, most of them are just um, uh, information for our certificates. But one question, um, can I not go to Git web, web page and upload whatever I've created, amended at the end of the day? You can also do that. But I find this more tedious, but you can also do this. Um, this Git command rebase is quite nice. Um, I, ref I have some references for this because um, this is like the, the next um, level thing. It's a small step. It's a very useful command uh, when you know how to, to use it. Um, yeah. What is the other one? Uh, if you have GitHub website and you cannot automatically update site if you change something locally. Uh, to submit questions. That's, that's, I think, in response to why you can't just... Ah, okay. Yeah. I, I mean, you can you can do a lot of things um, there. You can create a branch, you can upload your files, and you can do exactly the same, the same thing. I would say this is um, not the classical um, workflow and uh, the easiest way. So in summary, 
Um, two ways, so what we learned, two ways how to create a local a repository, how to track our changes, how to create branches, how to keep a repository up to date with the remote repository and how to share your developments. These are quite a lot of things. This is quite the backbone of um, collaboration um, for coding. Uh, don't get um, scared. There is a lot of resources and help out there. And um, the good thing is with Git is all about to undo changes. We have not um, discussed this topic today because this is quite another topic. Um, this would be like the, the follow up uh, on these, but this is what if you follow um, those few rules and if you have known how to use these few commands, you can quite do a lot and it's only a small step to be able with another set of commands to to undo your changes. Um, do you have anything to add about GitHub Actions? GitHub Actions? Mm, no, I'm used too much GitLab. I'm not really um, can add anything for this. I'm sorry. Um, maybe for the end. So there are many more useful commands. Git dash, git blame, one of my favorites and git tag. Um, here are some more great resources, sheet sheets, um, the 50 most important git commands with some explanations and examples. Um, please have a look here. And maybe if there's, let's finish with a small little, little assessment. So, um, just put in the, in the uh, chat A, B, C, or the D. This is me. Okay, okay. Which commands do not induce any changes? Git status A, B, git log, C, git fetch, or D, or three. I count till 10, and then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. It's actually D, it's really all three. They do not induce any changes. They just retrieve information and visualize things. Choose the commands that track all changes. A, git add dot, git add, ah, oh, this is actually minus minus all. B, git commit minus M and then a message or git add file name. And I have to maybe specify, so track all changes in your working directory. Yes, and I can see everyone is A. That's the right one. Oh, bug in my visualizations here. What happens with the following command? Git checkout minus B feature X. It creates A, it creates a new branch. B switches to the new branch. C changes in your working directory are staged. D, A, option A and B. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Yes, and it's D. So this is the combination of git branch feature X and then git checkout feature uh, feature X. It's quite handy. Uh, let me move. Git's principle of version control is based on single centralized repository and multiple remote copies. True or false? Yes, I can, let's be, it's false. And the last point, when you want to create a Git repository, you have to start with Git clone, true or false? So yes, and in fact, you don't have to start with git clone. You can also start with git init. And finishing with this point, 
Um, I'm happy to take any feedback also in the Google Doc or in the message, email, Twitter, um, GitLab on this repository. Um, we skipped the mini task too that is there. Please feel free and have a look there and I'm happy to see any um, graphs or code that you use this Git repository to play with and test um, and have a look. I'm happy to respond to any pull request. Um, at my last slide, I would like to point out to us another my list of favorite resources. Happy Git with R from Jenny Bryan um, is the resource or had been the resource for me to learn about Git and use an R, which is really guides you from the beginning to the end. It um, complains the different scenarios how you start uh, your project, if you start in GitHub, if you start locally and so ever, it explains how um, the differences between ATP, HTTPS and SSH, how to set up um, those keys. Please have a look there, it's a fantastic read. Then there are some sheet sheets that I'm regularly referring to. Here you also have uh, the link to the rebasing, merging versus rebasing. When you do, um, when it's better to do which use which command and the number of blog posts, which I actually also had a new uh, recently read in order to prepare for this presentation. And with that, I actually go back to this slide and I pull up the videos to see you all. Uh, thank you. I hope. I could um, guide you or give you steps or maybe small new information um, regarding it. Definitely. Thank you so much, Justin. And we are done on time. Uh, thank you everyone again for participating. Um, yeah, I'll see you next week if you're participating in our Zero to Shiro series and see you in four weeks if um, you are joining us for the last Our Lady Soulbox series. Thank you all.